So welcome everybody to our seminar. So for me, it's a great pleasure to have, for me and for our program, to have Brenda today in our seminar. Thank you very much again, Brenda, for accepting the, the invitation. So Brenda Betancu is an assistant professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Florida. So uh, previously, she was a postdoctoral associate in the Department of Statistical Science at Duke University. She has a PhD in statistics at the University of California, a master degree, degree in statistics from the University of Puerto, Puerto Rico. Brenda is from Bogota, Colombia, where she obtained her undergraduate degree at the, at the, at the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. So I met Brenda at um, some Latin America Congre Congresses on Bayesian statistics, but we we had this year um, more contact when I I was at the University of Florida working as a visiting professor. So I'm very 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 happy to have Brenda here, uh, to have Brenda professor, but also also to have Brenda my friend. Okay, <laughs> so Brenda, thank you very much, and it's up to you. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. That was a, a great introduction. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation. So, um, okay, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about prior distributions for record linkage structures. Uh, this is a joint work uh, with Giacomo Sanella at Bocconi University and Rebecca Stewart at Duke University. So what is record linkage? So record linkage is the task of merging large noisy databases to remove duplicated information. So this task of uh, record linkage is one that uh, we can find in many, many applications in practice. Uh, one of them is, for example, electronic health records, where we can have uh, databases uh, from, say, a medical institution, uh, pharmacies, um, health insurance, uh, uh, information from the same people, but uh, that for some reason uh, they don't have a unique identifier across databases, and also very often because of privacy reasons, then they remove, uh, you know, identifying information such as, you know, addresses, names, or uh, other things um, that could be useful to identify people uniquely. So if we want to use um, the information that is contained in multiple databases, uh, sometimes in practice we will need to merge those databases, but again, it's not an easy task if we don't have unique identifiers. And also we can have uh, corrupted, degraded, or noisy, or even out-of-date information that could make it difficult for us to identify a person as being the same. Okay. So, uh, I don't know, well, I guess you heard what I was saying, you just couldn't see, right? Uh, so, record linkage then, uh, because we're trying to merge multiple uh, records from different databases, uh, we can see this, e this problem as a clustering problem in which we're trying to um, merge, well, uh, cluster records that belong to the same unknown latent entity. Right, so we don't know exactly who this person is, and we don't know exactly what the the current information is, but we have information from different sources, and we will just group um, records that we think uh, belong to the same person. Okay, so um, what I'm going to be talking today is how we can formulate. Uh, prior distributions for this clustering task in a case where the number of data points in each cluster is going to remain very small, even when we have large data sets. This problem is uh, what we have called the micro-clustering problem. And what happens there is that if you think about it, if you have maybe four or five databases that you want to merge, then you don't expect to see say, a hundred records that belong to the same person. Uh, you may just see three, four, five max, even 10 maximum, but you will never see like the same person being repeated in, the, in all the databases a uh, large number of times. 
So this is basically the focus of um, the work that the work that I'm going to be showing today. So we're just going to be talking about random partitions model or models that allow us to do a clustering task that has this micro clustering property where the clusters are going to remain small regardless of uh, the size of the data. So besides uh, record linkage, which is the motivating application that I have been using for my work, uh, recent uh, work has also come up dealing with other applications of uh, microclustering. Uh, these are just some of them. For example, Anglo-Saxon settlements, uh, clustering of Anglo-Saxon uh, settlements for historical research, DNA, clustering of DNA sequencing, uh, few to few cross domain matching, uh, object, object matching in uh, language processing, and also the analysis of sparse networks. Um, so I'm going to start uh, describing some of the notation. The middle part of the talk is a little bit heavy, but uh, I just want to, you know, as long as you understand. So uh, these are just other applications of microclustering, uh, but the one I'm going to be focusing on is just record link. So some notation we're going to uh, well, when we're doing clustering, really what we're trying to do is a partitioning of the data in right in different clusters. So we're going to consider that the number of clusters is going to be unknown or random. Uh, and then the division of the data points into clusters can be represented by a partition that we're going to be denoting as pi sub n. And um, C1 to CK are just going to be the clusters. OK, so I'm going to assume I have a capital K cluster clusters, and then those are you know, the number of clusters is just random. So the partition, uh, partition in general, uh, can also be described using n cluster assignments or allocation variables, uh, z1 to zn, where ci equal to k, it means that uh, record i, if we have, you know, a database with records, record i was assigned to cluster um, ck, basically. Okay? So, just the main idea is that we're going to be uh, talking about how to propose prior distributions for these cluster assignments in a way that preserves the or gives us the microclustering property that we need to have for the particular application of record linkage. Okay, so and then the values S1 to SK is going to denote uh, the cluster sizes meaning that you know sj is just the number of elements that are in cluster uh, cj uh, so one very uh, popular model for that is used for clustering general clustering tasks is uh, the Dirichlet process um, mixture model i'm not sure if everyone's familiar with this but if you're not uh, i'm just gonna explain basically what it does so the Dirichlet process is known to uh, provide a very nice and easy way of creating a partition of your data. So what I have here is the representation of what is called the Chinese restaurant process. This is basically a sequential way of creating, uh, of sampling from the Dirichlet process. And what that analogy with the Chinese restaurant process does is it tells you that if you have an element and you want to assign it to one of your clusters, the clusters here are going to be your tables in the restaurant, then the probability of assigning this new element to a cluster or table is going to be proportional to the number of people or records or whatever you know, elements that you uh, have already assigned uh, to that cluster. And then alpha here is just a concentration parameter that is the probability of creating a new cluster or basically opening a new table in the restaurant. So uh, this is a very nice uh, uh, predictive rule, basically, that the Dirichlet process has. And that's why, because it's very, very easy and very computationally tractable, many, many um, uh, cluster appli clustering applications use this uh, distribution as a prior distribution again on that vector of cluster assignments. So this is just basically a prior on random partitions, but uh, the difference with, or the reason 
why we want to create new prior distributions is that uh, the leadership process is known to have a rich to get a uh, rich get richer behavior if you see uh, if there are a lot of people in this cluster already then the next person is going to be more likely to be seated there so it's doing what i don't want it to do that is that the clusters are going to keep growing and growing as in grows so uh, to control that we're going to have to um, sacrifice some properties right and that's what i'm going to be uh, giving you details about in a little bit uh, there is also the pit manager process this is an extension of a generalization of the literature process uh, the literature process has an exponential tail behavior on the cluster sizes and then the pit manager process has a power law tail behavior in the cluster sizes but they both have this characteristic that basically uh, the cluster sizes grow linearly with them so they're going to keep growing and growing okay so the property that we're trying to um or we're going to have to sacrifice is the exchangeability property so exchangeability is that we have uh, uh some observe a sequence of observed uh data points um and those come from are basically the first n elements of an infinite sequence of exchangeable data points. And this is going to imply that the partition on n can be just obtained as uh, some restriction of an exchangeable random partition of the natural numbers to the set of the first n integers. Right? So this is just basic definition of what exchangeability is. Uh, however, under the assumption of infinite exchangeability, the size of each cluster is going to grow linearly with the number of data points. That's just something that's going to happen when you have that property. So what we're going to do is to sacrifice that uh, exchangeability to be able to obtain a model that has the microclustering property. So the microclustering property, I've been talking about it without really defining it uh, formally, is we're going to say that a sequence of random partitions satisfies the microclustering property if uh, the ratio of the size of the largest cluster over n uh, goes to zero in probability as n goes to infinity. What that means is, again, that as the number of data points grow, the size of this, each cluster is just going to remain small. So no mixture, none of the mixture models that are out there right now can exhibit this property unless we force the parameters of those models to vary with n. And that's not uh, very practical in general because there is no uh, way of uh, doing that in an easy way that will apply generally for many, many applications. So what we did is we started, uh, we started trying to propose some models that would allow us to do this. So again, these models are, are non-exchangeable models, uh, but they're going to still be projective. That's kind of like the other property that these models tend to have. Uh, so we have um, two previous works where we define uh, two random partitions model, partition models that exhibit the microclustering property, and they're both based on the Kolkian representation of Gibbs partitions. So this is just kind of like a summary slide. I'm going to be a little bit of details of uh, what the Kolkian representation is. Um, but uh, it's a little technical, so I just want you to have kind of like the general idea of what we're doing. So the two models that we propose are um, uh, the negative binomial, are denoted as the negative binomial, negative binomial, that is the MBMB model, and the negative binomial literature model, uh, which is the MBD model. And one caveat of these models is that they lack some uh, asymptotic properties and interpretability. But I'm just going to go over the details of that and then why we ended up with the last model, which is kind of like the state of the art model that uh, we're proposing for microclustering. So, the Kolkian representation of GIF partitions, uh, we're just going to denote the distribution of GIF partitions uh, in this way, where we have B and W that are two neg non negative sequences. And the models that we are doing, or well, the Kolkian representation, this just in general, is it has this structure, which is we are going to assume a distribution kappa on k. Remember that capital K is the number of clusters that we have. 
um, that which is a random quantity, obviously. And then S1 to SK are the cluster sizes. And this distribution is going to be conditioned on capital K, which is the number of clusters. And we're also going to assign a distribution, a probability distribution to the cluster sizes. So if you look at this, it looks basically as though you're placing a prior distribution of the number of clusters and a prior distribution of the cluster sizes. And obviously, you know, these are probability distribution of the positive integers because um, that's just by definition how it goes. So this is basically the Colkian representation of cube partitions. So in general, it's kind of like if we were placing a distribution on the number of clusters and the number of cluster sizes. And then obviously this is going to be conditional on the cluster sizes uh, adding up to n, right? Like n uh, in this um setup basically would be a random variable but in practice of course n is given to us so we have to condition on that and uh when we do that conditioning then the same this corresponds to uh, the marginal distribution of the cluster sizes of uh, a gibbs partition um so the micro clustering models that it went away again uh, sorry, Brenda, I just have a quick question on your notation. Just to make sure I understood it. So uh -huh. when you say, so your kappa s, is the is it the probability that k is equal to 0s? Uh, over here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so okay, cool. So kappa s, yeah, those are probabilities. Same for mu. So, yeah, same for mu. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. cool. That's, that's a pretty good question, actually. Uh, okay. So the MBMB model is obtained uh, by assuming uh, kappa, I said already, is the negative binomial, negative binomial model. So we're just basically assuming negative binomial distributions for that. What that means is that the density function of the negative binomial is what's going to give us uh, what we just said, right? Like the probability of, uh, say, we're doing it for mu, the probability of a cluster of size s, right? Yeah, uh, you get the, the density function from the negative binomial. Uh, the MBD model, uh, which is the negative binomial Dirichlet model, is just, again, going to have kappa as a negative binomial. But then for mu, we're going to be a little bit more flexible, and we're going to assume that mu is a random probability vector with a Dirichlet distribution. And what we do is to say that the, um, uh, the measure that we're using for the Dirichlet distribution could be a negative binomial or a geometric or whatever you choose. Uh, in that case, again, a distribution on the positive on the positive integers. And what we see is that uh, the MBD is way more flexible in general than the MBMB. And we could see then that empirically, because we could improve properties for those specific models, um, we're going to say why in a little bit, uh, they provide a good performance in terms of uh, uh, record linkage tasks um, and obviously giving us smaller clusters. But these models uh, have some limitations and those limitations come from the fact that we have this condition, right? Like when we're sampling our cluster sizes, they have to add up to n. And when you do that, then you lose some interpretability of kappa and mu. What you think could be your prior distribution on the number of clusters and the cluster sizes, that distribution, distribution can change a lot when you have to condition on n. Uh, so that's one issue. The second issue is an issue of identifiability. You can easily modify the parameters kappa and mu without changing the distribution of the resulting random partition. We didn't have any asymptotic properties. Those are, for example, in, um, the number of the expected number of clusters or the expected number of uh, clusters of each size, things like that, that are, um, you know, characterize the whole uh, prior the same way that we, like the DP has, we, the digital process has. We would like to do that, uh, but we couldn't do it with this um, specification. And then the other thing, again, as I had mentioned before, uh, parameters varying within, if we want to have a reasonable prior in practical micro clustering settings, we will still need to choose a different kappa for different values of n. So we will need basically the parameters of kappa to be depending on n, and that's not an easy thing to do if we want to have a 
type of default prior distribution that could be used in general for microclustering tasks. So what we did then, like we had studied this and we know that it kind of works, but we wanted to be a little bit more formal with things. So now what we're gonna do is to assume that we have an exchangeable sequence of clusters. So we're dealing with exchangeability, but not on the observation, but on the observations, but on the clusters. And we're going to assume, uh, you know, it's an exchangeable sequence of clusters with finite sizes. And then the data points then are going to be assumed to simply arise from the union of these uh, uh, finite clusters. And we have a condition here. This is more theory, obviously, if you want more details, uh, the paper is in archive, which you can take a look at this. But what we have now is instead, we're trying to get rid of that conditioning on N that we had before. That was just kind of like um, reducing the flexibility of the model and the interpretability. Now we have this conditioning uh, on this event, basically, that there is, exists a case such that we have what we need, right? N is still a given value. Uh, we just change the way the clusters are defined so we can prove some theoretical properties about them. Uh, so in general, this, we're going to call these the ESC models. These are just exchangeable sequences of clusters. And uh, for these ESC models, then a random partition pi sub n is going to be denoted this way when we are basically sampling from the ESC models. And it's going to depend on a parameter p sub uh, mu, and this is basically just a prior distribution of mu. So because the way we're um, uh, establishing the, the model now, then, you know, it's only going to depend on mu. Then we don't have that uh, prior that, or that distribution. Um, if you want a, a sample from these models, you basically, you know, now you're going to have the prior distribution for mu. Uh, where mu, again, is the distribution for uh, the cluster sizes. You can define uh, capital K as the unique positive integer such that um, you satisfy the conditioning. And then you can define the cluster allocation variables as a uniformly a random permutation of a vector of this form. So you can do this sampling um, with a important sampler. All the description is in the paper, but in practice it's actually easier because you can always, you know, the same way uh, that you can, uh, for example, truncate things with uh, the Dirichlet process, you can do the same with the exchangeable sequence of clusters models. Uh, can you guys, are you guys hearing me fine and seeing fine? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So with this uh, formulation, basically, uh, now, before with the, with the Colkin uh, characterization of the models that we had before, we couldn't really prove formally uh, that we had the microclustering property, those we just have empirical results. So now with this uh, specification, we can do that. The only condition that we need, this is just ba the basic definition of the microclustering property that I had uh, given you before. The only assumption that we need is that the expectation of mu, or the mean of mu, that whatever distribution you choose there has to be finite. And that's not really hard to satisfy the negative binomial distribution has it. Pretty much any specification uh, that I can think of has that um, property. And then the other thing that's important that we wanted to have for these models is the same way that you have that Chinese restaurant process scheme to sample from the digital process. We also want to have something similar, and that's what we call here reallocation probabilities. So in a similar way, you can seed someone in an existing table with uh, this probability over here or open a new table or cluster in uh, with a probability with the probability that you see here so in computational terms uh, whatever you do with the dp when you're doing clustering you can also do with the, these models just by replacing you know the corresponding probabilities of assignment to different clusters uh, for these 
uh, um, rule that we have over here. Uh, asymptotic properties that we have, uh, we can prove, uh, you don't need to know the details of that proof, but again, if the mean or the expectation of mu is uh, finite, then the, we can show theoretically that the number of clusters grow linearly with them. So remember, the microclustering property means that the cluster sizes grow sublinearly within, right? You, we don't want them to keep growing and growing. But when you are doing that, what you end up with is with the number of clusters actually growing linearly with them. You want to have a lot of many, many small clusters. So we can uh, prove that. And then also the proportion of clusters of a given size is uh, basically all this thing. What it says is that it coincides, it con coincides with mu. So in this case, with this specification, you can actually think of mu as a prior distribution on the cluster sizes. And in that sense, then it's very easy to incorporate prior information. Whatever you choose P of mu to be, then you know that's kind of like the prior behavior that you're given it and it's not, it's easy to interpret. Uh, so we have all those uh, properties. So now I'm just gonna show you um, uh, some simulation studies that we did. So this is the record linkage model. So far, we were just talking about the prior on the cluster assignments or the prior on the random partitions. That's going to help us do the clustering. We haven't really talked about the data model, which is just uh, the model that you use for your data, right? So generally, uh, in record linkage, you will have multiple databases where you have um, hopefully some fields that are shared among those databases. So you can have, for example, the birth uh, date, uh, the gender, maybe education level, you know, we're just considering here, this example is only for categorical data, but you know, there are models that you can do uh, use, uh, that you can do using uh, string data. Say if you have names or addresses or things like that, then you can, um, there are models for that too. Here is just categorical for the purpose of this illustration. So this is the model for the data, uh, why, it's just going to represent those true latent entities that I'm trying to cluster my actual data to. So that will be the true person that I don't know what it is. And I will try to just uh, cluster my observations to that. Uh, beta over here is just a uh, distortion probability. So remember that we expect to, that our data is not clean. If it was perfectly clean and all the records were if you have three records of the same person and they were perfectly exactly the same, then this would be a very easy problem, right? But generally we're going to have uh, typing errors, outdated information, things that add noise that make hard, uh, make this problem hard. And so, and this part of the model is just what we just did, right? We're specifying a prior on random partitions. And in this case, we're just taking an ESC model as our prior distribution. So this is just, uh, all the simulations are just based on a 1,000 records with a distortion of the fields of 5%. That's the distortion I'm adding, the noise I'm adding to my data. And we're just doing five fields of information with 10 categories each. Remember, this is just a categorical model. And what you're seeing here is just uh, the red lines are the true distribution the true partition distribution. What that means is that uh, the true partition has 250 clusters of, clusters of size one, 150 clusters of size two, 100 clusters of size three, and so on, right? So the red line in all the plots is the same. And the dots that you see, or the circles that you see, is what is the estimated partition from each of the models, okay? So what we expect or what we would want to see is that our ESC models capture those partitions better than the traditional models, right? Because we're in a, in a setting, in a micro-clustering setting. So we expect these two, our models to be better. So what we see in this example, we are, uh, this is the type of distribution where that favors the DP. 
in the sense that the DPE tends to uh, create a small number of big clusters. In this case, the maximum cluster size is just five, right? So they're still small clusters. And it tends to give us a large number of uh, small ones or singletons. So we see here that the DPE and Pittman Jordan tend to overestimate a little bit the number of singletons, while our models tend to do a little bit better overall. But all of them in this example kind of miss the maximum cluster size, right? So all of them are basically estimating that you have uh, that the maximum cluster size is eight. So not perfect, but uh, we're performing better in that case. This is another example where we now have basically a uniform distribution on the cluster sizes for clusters of sizes one to four. So remember, the red is the, tr the truth, and then uh, we're trying to capture that truth. So again, we see, right, the DP is trying to, again, mimic that behavior where it gives me like a decaying behavior, where it gives me a small number of uh, large clusters. In this case, large is still small, and a large number of small clusters or singletons. So, uh, it does a worse in this case, and then our ESC models are just are better, right? Uh, not perfectly uniform, but still better. And especially the ESCD is still estimating a few of sizes five and six, but is the one that performs the best, which is the closest to the true uniform distribution. And then uh, we have another uh, distribution, which is just unimodal, basically. And then again, we see the DP and Pitman Jure struggling some with the singletons because what they do normally is to give you a, a large number of singletons. And then our priors from these two, we see again the ESCD, which is we knew it was the more flexible one, is kind of fitting that true distribution of the cluster sizes uh, much better. Okay, so what this shows us is that um we have that our the models that we propose are uh, more flexible in them in terms of the types of clo the cluster size distributions that they can fit and obviously we decide them we design these models to work better in cases of um, a small clusters or micro clustering so we expect them to generally perform better uh, in those scenarios and uh, that's Oh, I have a last one here, pretty much the same behavior, struggling with singletons, not really capturing, and then the ESCD is kind of like the best one of it all. So the conclusion is um, we propose, these are again um, non-parametric models uh, for clustering tasks, uh, specifically micro-clustering tasks where we expect the cluster sizes to remain small, even when the size of the data increases. Uh, these uh, models have the same, there is no additional cost to uh, using these models compared to the DP. We have that same nice uh, reallocation probability uh, mechanism, right? Similar to the Chinese restoring process, so it's, it's very, very similar. And we have also very nice um, asymptotic properties of uh, the models. The paper is already in archive, uh, one version of it, and then the paper has been accepted to JASA. Hopefully, I don't know when it's going to come out, but hopefully it will come out online not too far away. Uh, we also have the a uh, GitHub repository with the code for it right now is already public. I should have put it there, but I didn't. If you're interested, just ask me. But we also submitted uh, the code to CRAN because it's an R package. So we're going through the process of getting it accepted right now. So hopefully soon there will be an R package with um, all the code to do uh, everything that I um, show you. Uh, okay, so that's... That would be it. Okay, Brenda. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>
Sorry, it was such a bumpy ride. I, I think it was just Firefox. For yeah, it, it was a good idea to change the, the browser. Yeah. So thank you very much, Brenda, for the excellent presentation. Congratulations for your work. Congratulations Thanks. that it's, it's almost accepted mm -hmm. to the journal. <laughs> thank you. Hi, Brenda. I actually have one. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It was really nice. And I particularly enjoyed uh, your uh, proposed prior because like DP is so popular and it has that problem of getting lots of singletons. Like from one side, it, it is kind of nice because you don't need to do like reversible jumps, which are mm -hmm. a pain to program. But on the other hand, then you're just starting to have these very redundant clusters and that, that kind of stuff. Yes. So I find it very nice, your proposal there. Uh, and you are keeping the number of clusters as it being random, right? Yes. So you still have, that. okay, that, that's nice. And another thing is, uh, I was thinking, is it easy to see from the formulation of your ESCD mm -hmm. that it would uh, not have this undesirable property of giving you unnecessary singleton clusters? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, because from the DP, as you like think a little bit about it, it's perfectly clear why that phenomena happens. But at least to me that I, I think it is all too new to me, this ESCD. Mm -hmm. So if you can just like uh, explain it again, like why, what is there in the formulation that avoids that kind of problem? Uh, it's going to depend on your, um, the prior that you use for, so that P sub M, that is what all the ESC depends on. So it's going to depend on how you specify that. So let me, I don't know why I closed that, sorry. Let me go to the slide. Can you see my slides now or no? Uh-huh. Okay. So in the, where we have the reallocation probabilities, right? Like the same way where you do with the DP that you can actually see just from the probabilities that uh, you have to assign to an existing cluster or a new one while you will mm -hmm. be generating too many singletons. Then the same thing happens here. It kind of, well, we have the general property from the formulation, but now the mu is really what's going to give you uh, more flexibility. So, for example, if you assume that the mu has kind of like a geometric decaying behavior where you have more singletons, right? If it's mm -hmm. the number of clusters of size one, and then you go down, then you could expect to have a little bit more, you know, favor in, uh, you will be favoring the singleton clusters, right? Right, And that comes from this, basically. This is the probability of clusters of size one, this new one that I'm highlighting there, right? I so, see, I see. So you could change, you could assume uh, this formulation that we have is pretty general, though, and we tested it out with different uh, distribution distributions. But if you have a very strong belief on how your um, your um, true data is, then you could include more of that just by giving it the information through the prior distribution. Um, okay, but but you do allow a prior on these on these mules, right? Mm -hmm. So it's more like how you choose. So, so what I mean is that you don't need to actually fix what the mu's are in your model, so that you can do inference easier, right? You you can just put a prior and uh -huh. just put a prior on the mu's, and then that's it. But yeah, just by nature, the setup of the model, uh, because we are sacrificing exchangeability, that that naturally is not letting the cluster sizes to grow linearly within. So it's uh -huh. kind of like constricting, like a restricted cluster size just by definition of the model. Um, I see, I see. Thank you. That's a really nice thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, Thank you very much. Yeah, the paper, mm. the paper obviously is more clear and it has more applications. Um, so definitely take a look if you're interested. Yeah, yeah, I already took a note of what is the reference there? So I can yeah. search it on the archive. Okay. Really nice. Thank you very much, Brenda. Okay. Okay, more questions from Brenda?
Brenda, uh, I... Okay, we need back. Oh, so, sorry, guys. Talk. So, uh, okay, okay. It's, it's just a little question. Um, thank you very much for the talk. It's an excellent talk. Uh, just uh, about the, pr the prior choice, uh, have you some concern about uh, no informative priors or informative priors? Um, not really. I mean, we have um, the two uh, the two specifications, right? So we chose yeah. uh, P sub mu, which is just the prior for the cluster sizes in one case. We're making that just a fixed negative binomial, right? Meaning that the density mm -hmm. function of that is what gives you the probabilities of each cluster. And then this one, which is the more flexible one, is to assume that it's random, give it a Dirichlet distribution, and then you uh, assume a base measure for that Dirichlet distribution. Uh, this one, I don't think we can see, we've seen that uh, for the e for the MBE specification, it's not as flexible, and in that case, it can really affect the results. But for the more flexible one, which is this one, uh, it's pretty robust, basically. So it really, it's very flexible in that whatever your data is telling you, it, tra it tries to accommodate that. Uh, so nobody worried about it. Um, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, but definitely with the ESCD one, like that's the, the winner overall of everything, we, everything we've seen. So if you're gonna use one, then just use that one, which is the more flexible one. More questions? So, um, I have maybe two questions. Mm -hmm. So, Brenda, as I'm not so familiar with non-parametric approach, so I try to do some comparison with mixture models, that's something that I'm more familiar. Mm -hmm. and, and my question is, I don't know if I lost something, but um, do you have the usual problems of the uh, non-identifiability -identifi of mixture models. Do you have, did you, did you have these problems here and have you discussed that or mm -hmm. tried yeah. to do some alternatives? Yeah, we have, we have the same issues of, you, you're talking about the label switching yeah. issue. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's just exactly the same issue that we always have, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. No, no, no new solution for that. We just do the typical mm. thing, which is just look at functions okay. of the label of the clusters um, to see how the 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 performance is. In our case, because we're doing, it's just basically a classification problem. We're just using error rates, uh, the false negative rate, mm -hmm. false positive rate, identifying if we put the people in the same cluster. We don't care too much yeah. about the actual labeling. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the other one is you, you said that in the paper you you applied it to some real data. Mm -hmm. And what was the, the size of the, the sample size? Uh, so as you work in here with 1,000, I think. Yeah. So we still, have, uh, we still have issues of scalability uh actually even when so for in the first paper that we had we proposed where we're basically using an equivalent for microclustering of the split and merge algorithm that helps us do things faster but we cannot do this with millions of records yet so in the paper we have i think three applications i think the sample sizes there are around four thousand or so and it takes mm -hmm. still like a day or something to run. Yeah. So it's still imagine. not, mm -hmm. yeah. And the code, well, the code is done in our CPP, so I'm pretty sure that's an issue okay. too. If it was Python or something different, then it would yeah. probably run faster. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, we're not able to do this easily the way it is right now with um, a hundreds of thousands or millions because it, it would just take forever. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brenda. Let's thank again to Brenda. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much to Brenda for being here with us. I hope to see you again in Brazil, but there <laughs> is a university. Yes. <laughs>